This is the Game Trudy.biz microcast. I am James Batchelor and I'm joined this week as ever by Christopher Dring. How are you, sir? I'm, I'm, I'm great. Good. Invigorated. I'm feeling optimistic because we wrote some pieces on Friday which were not the world is going to die. We did. It was, it was nice ending the week on these are the things that the industry has got to look forward to. And like, not just you, but Brendan as well in This Week in I Business know. had a slightly optimistic, which I mean, I can't remember the last time I had an optimistic This Week in Business to run on the site. So, uh, I mean, some it, was do- semi, it was semi-optimistic. It was. It was it heavily as- caveated <laughs> moth optimism. Is the, yeah. But that's, that's the type of optimism you get with Brendan. Heavy, heavily caveated optimism is his brand of optimism. Yeah. So it was uh, excellent. That's what I thought. That was what who thought? It's my watch. <laughs> <laughs> my watch has started talking. Um, <laughs> well, question for you or your watch. Um, <laughs> did you catch the uh, state of play, the PlayStation state of play? And what was your what was your highlight? I did catch the state of play, and it was you know I used I like the, the the Xbox One. You know there was there was a lot of good stuff in there. Nothing that I thought wow it's going to change things. Yeah, but um, it was I thought it was a good a good state of play for me. Um, I just. Uh, Ken Levine's back, right? Yeah. And, um, and that's got to be my highlight because I've, we, it's been 10 years. <laughs> it's like 10 years since Bioshock Infinite and since he decided to close Irrational and sort of make a game quicker with a smaller team and then take 10 years to make a game that looks an awful lot like Bioshock. But hey, I'm on board. Like, I'm, I, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm going to be cynical about it, but I'm, I, I'm interested. So this is the thing. I've seen a lot of... Uh, I've heard like Judas, a lot of podcasts. Judas is the game. Judas is the game. I've heard a lot of um, criticism. Not criticism, but I've heard a lot of comments and like snide remarks and stuff like on Twitter or on podcasts or whatever, like, you know, that Ken Levine is just making another game that looks like Bioshock. Bioshock is like one of the best games I've ever played. Like, like the, the Bioshock games, all three of them are amazing. So why would we not want something like we've Bioshock? Also, we've also not had one of those. I mean, it just looks a little, but I'm sure it's yeah. different. Like, oh, yeah. It, but it, it, it's, it, we've not had a game like Bioshock, really. Well, no. I guess you had some of those, some of those arcane games sort of, you know, a little bit. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm on board. I thought that was, I looked, that looked just me. I like Silent Hill's back. I, I was, a, I'm not, I'm not convinced, but I also... But I want to be. Um, so that was that was um, that was uh, that was interesting. I quite like look at those sort of things as well. But yeah, I thought it was it was solid. It was it was there was a lot of good stuff. I think if you're a PlayStation fan, if you're into those sort of franchises, there was plenty there for you to get excited about. I know people. There wasn't too much first party. Um, Death Stranding, obviously, but technically not a Microsoft studio, not a Sony studio. Yeah. Um, um, but um, uh, it had the. Cl- I tell you what, I saw which I hadn't seen from PlayStation for a while was announcing a game that isn't in the works yet. Yes, you know, I used to, I used to, I used to do that all the time. I used to be their mo for early PS4 generation, but announcing basically a new Metal Gear Solid, but not but from not Kojima yet. when he's finished making the two games he's making already. It, it's, <laughs> it, it, but you know, I that made me smile. I miss those days. So you should be aside from Judas. That was my highlight. Was oh great, a new Kojima, Kojima stealth game because I love my stealth games and like and yeah. his are his are great. Um, I can't get into Death Stranding and that sort of thing. It's just not my sort it's of thing. It's a weird so, game. Death it's Stranding. weird. Yeah, it's weird. I'm watching watching the sequel it doesn't look any less weird. The one thing that disappointed me about um, Death Stranding Two was I remember interviewing Kojima before he started working on Death Stranding. He was talking about how I think he referred to it as like the stick and the rope, um, and like most games are built like the, you know, the the concept of like the tools of humanity are the stick and the rope, and most people make games around the stick, i.e., you beat people with a stick. And he wanted to make a game around the rope, as in connecting people, and that became Death Stranding and the whole network connecting thing. And then, and there's definitely a reference in the trailer to both stick and rope, but this looked a lot more combat centric, and it's like it's kind of a shame to see him go the other way with it. Is it called Death Stranding Two on the Beach? It is called Death Stranding Two on the Beach. I, you gotta love that. You gotta love that. <laughs> yeah. Also, last last point on um, Death Stranding and state of play in general. I love how I've seen I've, I've seen a couple of comments and stuff like, oh, you know, only Kojima would be crazy enough to come up with like an electric guitar that is also a lightning gun." Those people have clearly never seen Despicable Me Three, where they've done the same thing with the synth keyboard. Like Kojima's clearly a parent, or at least a, an Illumination fan. <laughs> he loves all films, doesn't he? He does love all films. Yeah. 
Okay, um, let's dive into some larger stories from the last week. Um, first of all, one that's actually picked up over this past weekend. There's rumours and sources and reports going on that Xbox is bringing a number of first-party titles to other systems, specifically PlayStation 5. The two titles that are being touted as being ported are Indiana Jones of the Great Circle, which was unveiled uh, last month. Big first-party title. Uh, it's come from Machine Games, coming out in autumn. I can't wait. Um, sorry, Indiana Jones fanboy moment there. And then Starfield is rumoured to be coming to PlayStation 5, apparently after the, I think the Shattered Space is the name of the expansion. Once the expansion's out, they'll then bring it to PlayStation 5. They're rumours at this stage, we have to kind of emphasise that. But I think no, it's interesting that. to talk about Microsoft's attitude to bringing its properties to other platforms. Yeah. Yes, it's... it's I, I... For starters, I, I've I've heard similar stories. I haven't heard those two games. I've mm. heard sort of, I'm not going to name them. You know, I'm I'm not that I'm not that kind of journalist that just drops stuff in podcasts. Despite what happened last week, um, the <laughs> um, um, uh, I, I I I I've heard of there are games coming to PlayStation and Switch, and they but they're, they're games um, that don't necessarily contradict. I don't think they're competitive. I don't think it would harm the Xbox console business necessarily. They're, they're sort of smaller games, niche games, mm. older games. Not all of them, but they will. You know, when you sit, when you, when you, the ones I've heard, you go, oh yeah, that makes sense, right? Um, Starfield yeah. and Indiana Jones are like big system sellers, so I'm a bit, um, I'm a little bit more surprised by that. Um, but um, the 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 bits that um, so regardless, so yeah, regardless of what the rumor is, um, it doesn't Microsoft has lost has been beaten by playstation my comparison to this by the way and i'm actually started toying around with a piece about it is not sega everyone's comparing it to sega for me it's more comparable to nintendo hmm. when nintendo came out of the gamecube nintendo had lost to playstation they could not beat playstation um they ended up going what do we do they go well what who isn't playstation talking to you know what could we do instead what's our and then they came up with project revolution which is an unusual act of hubris for a company <laughs> it's just been <laughs> soundly thrashed in the console space and they and they and they they went in a different way in a different market and, and they sort of end up having to pivot again when apple came along but they just went right you know this isn't real war like people aren't actually defeated when they lose like they go and do they go and do different things and they go and react microsoft's revolution for a while has been not hardware related like, like the Marie remote but more uh, business models and, and you know mm. platforms and distribution and reach new audiences and new territories and and that obviously by the way as a given games are a part of that right the Wii Remote wouldn't have worked without Wii Sports and Microsoft's current strategy won't work without a good software lineup but it, it, it's it's these it's, that's what they're trying to do and actually releasing games on other platforms it's not only does it not contradict that strategy it's actually part of that strategy you have to release your games on other platforms um, obviously they don't have to release it on PlayStation Five. Because PS5 isn't 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 the big mark isn't the big opportunity that's mobile it's PC, but um, I I just think in terms of like, in terms of like making a bit of cash you know it doesn't contradict their main strategy they know they they've got to move beyond the console in order to be uh, relevant and bigger to be on the biggest games companies in the world which they already are um, and and you know you put some of these titles on PlayStation you'll find a new audience you make some money it's worth noting that a lot of these games you know particularly on the Xbox exclusive ones most people are accessing them via game pass so their revenues are a lot lower than they, their player numbers are really high but their revenue mm. would be a lot lower than it would have been if they were premium titles potentially not, not for all of them um and and so you know get a couple of these games on playstation you'll find um you'll find a decent audience i think you, there's a balancing act right between bringing games to more platforms because they do have a console business i know I've, i said they've been beaten but they've still got a console business that still makes money for them it's still very successful they've got a fan base that love it mm. so you they want to balance releasing games on other platforms with maintaining that 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 business for as long as they can but um uh, yeah it's certainly interesting this is they've done this before right ori in the will of the wisp ori in the blind forest came to switch and we talk about the rare games and all that kind of stuff but it's all you can understand that but Ori and the Will of the Wisp, uh, Ride of the Blind Forest, uh, Microsoft funded games mm. that they ported to Nintendo platforms, published them as well. They aren't Nintendo, they aren't, they are not Banjo Kazooie. There's no legacy there with those games. Now, it made sense. They're 2D Metroidvania games. Switch loves 2D Metroidvania games. So it, made, it kind of made sense as an audience perspective. It was a business opportunity. Nobody really made much of a fuss about it when it happened. Everyone's like, oh, that's interesting, and then sort of moved on. 
And this, for me, this is sort of similar. Starfield is on a different scale. I hadn't heard Starfield, but mm. even then, it would be over a, be a long time. We, the, if you wanted to play Starfield when it came out, you had to have an Xbox or a PC. Um, and I, I, but yeah, it's certainly. I, I would love to hear from Xbox. I, what do you, you know, it's, I, if this is what they're doing, and there's a lot of people saying that is it is where they're going. I'd, I'd like to hear from them and understand a little bit what the end game is, because mm. I think I know, but I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not them. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would be very, very interested to have that conversation with Microsoft right now. I think, like you said, like you know, the, the, the go-to comparison that people have been making, and I have to confess, even like the thought occurred to me, like, you know, will, will they go full-blown Sega? Not any time soon, but will they kind of drop the hardware side of things and just become a third-party publisher? That thought occurs. But the, the comparison's not the same. It's not the same comparison. It's not like for like. Um, because as you were kind of pointing out um, earlier, like... And as you've just pointed out, like they've already done this. We've already seen Microsoft titles on other platforms. You know, one of the best-selling titles on PlayStation is a Microsoft title. It's Minecraft. Like Minecraft the, is the, a, the, the best-selling third-party the best, game yeah. on Switch is Minecraft. Is Minecraft? Is, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The best-selling game on PlayStation is Call of Duty, also a Microsoft title. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, don't, yeah, I mean, I think Minecraft's like the biggest selling game of all time now, and that is primarily during, like, that's all primarily built up during its Microsoft ownership. So it's 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 not unheard of for Microsoft to release um, titles on other platforms, as you say. I think the the scale of these makes it interesting. Like, it's, yeah. it's I'm kind of I'm kind of divided on it. On, on the one hand, I'm like, I remember when Starfield was confirmed as an Xbox exclusive, and I remember thinking. Well, that makes sense because you own the studio. It's potentially a system selling sort of game. You would absolutely want that on your system. But now with Microsoft kind of reaching out kind of broader than just its own box and, you know, its box being the lowest selling box of the three, it does make sense to put these bits. Obviously, you give them timed exclusivity on your own systems, but it does make sense to kind of put them on the other ones and get, you know, get that audience if you can to kind of... You know, just build build up Microsoft and build up um, yeah. You know, Xbox's brand as a as a purveyor of games across all platforms. That makes sense to me. Or uh, Starfield on PlayStation, or in, Indie on PlayStation, because that sounds a bit more solid, perhaps. Indie on PlayStation will make a much bigger splash than Ori and the Will of the Wisps on Switch. It it, it will. Yeah. So, yeah, you can understand why they're going to go that way if that's what they're doing. Well, I sort of can. What I, what I, because Phil Spencer once said he'd put um, uh, all games on any platform that he could put Game Pass on, right? Mm. And that made sense to me because that's their platform effectively. We, we think of platform as a console, but actually for Xbox, it's Game Pass is a platform and Xbox Live is a platform. And these are all platforms. And as long as they can have an audience and an ecosystem, it doesn't matter what device it's on necessarily. Um, but obviously, I'm, I'm, nobody's suggesting Game Pass is coming to PlayStation. I'd be shocked if that happened. Yeah. So, so I'm a little bit surprised by it because um, I don't quite know. Is it just oh let's let's get Starfield a couple of million more players and actually make seventy dollars a pop on each box release? Right? Is it that, or is it is it is it a short term money thing, or is it a longer term? Hey, we're putting Starfield on PlayStation so everyone can go. Oh, I like the Starfield game. Oh, hang on, I could get this on PC and other devices in a subscription. Uh, I don't okay. know. I, I haven't quite... That's the bit that I haven't... Is, it, is this a really a strategic decision or is it more of a short-term financial one? And that's the bit that I don't I haven't quite leapt to in my mind. You know, it's not like it's a live service game in the way that, you know, um, Sea of Thieves or something like that is. Those games are like, for me, make yeah. a lot of sense to be as multi-platform as possible because it benefits those games potentially, quite substantially. But um, there's... there's it harms harms those games not to be multi-platform but yeah that's the bit i haven't quite i haven't quite grasped that here's the thing though all the platform holders are now multi-platform game developers you know the idea yeah. we, we they're all obviously xbox on a slight on a bigger scale but playstation games are all on pc and i know people go oh, the audiences are different but they, they are but they're also not there's definitely crossover there <laughs> and and you know nintendo released their games on iphone and it you know, I would argue iPhone has had a bigger, bigger negative impact upon Nintendo's business than PlayStation or Xbox have over the last ten years, so the last ten, fifteen years. Mm. So, um, I'm, I'm, 
I know that it's I know that it's these are different people don't see them as the same because of console war rhetoric and stuff but they are still devices that play games and these companies are releasing their games on them and I you know the console console audience has been 200 250 million players now for for 20 odd years it hasn't grown and they've been able to monetize those players more that you costs of making those games have gone up they've been able to monetize players more through micro attractions through DLCs through subscription but eventually that's there's a ceiling on that and eventually they're going to have to go, how do we get these console games to a bigger audience? And mm. the solution to that is new markets, multi-platform, new business models um, and new devices. Agreed. Um, I'm going to pick up on that lovely little segue you set up for me uh, and talk about live service games. Because um, I think, yeah, with this Microsoft stuff, there's not really much to say until Microsoft actually explains what the heck it's doing. But live service has also been a big topic of conversation um, over the last few days. Primarily because of a report that came out from Griffin Gaming Partners. Now, according to their survey of 537 studios across the globe, um, 95% of those studios are developing or maintaining a live service game. Now, it's important at this point to define a live service game. According to the survey, a live service game is any game with regular update cadence planned. So constantly getting kind of new content and so forth. So all games, <laughs> well, yeah, all games <laughs> potentially, yeah. Um, I mean, it's different though. It's not like it's. So we've, I think, we've all been having this conversation. Different people have different um, definitions of live service. I kind of see live service as um, any game. Typically, your live service game that first springs to mind is your multiplayer centric, microtransaction riddled, you know, events based, you know, battle passes, that sort of stuff. Like, yeah, like your Fortnites, your you know, Marvel snaps, your. Stuff like that, yeah, like Destiny, those sort of games. Technically, though, like other games are treated as live service. Ubisoft has been doing this with um, Assassin's Creed for a good couple of years. Like, you know, Valhalla and Odyssey were both treated like live service in terms of they had additional content and updates and, you know, in-game events and stuff released for ages afterwards. Like, it's it's a very kind of broad term live service and I think people have got a very kind of narrow, myself included sometimes, like a very kind of narrow view of it. A lot of the kind of criticism that's been around Suicide Squad, for example, which has just come out, has been because, oh, you know, it's Rocksteady moving away from that kind of Batman Arkham style and making more of a kind of a live service game because it's a multiplayer centric, it's looter shooter, it looks like it's going to be something that, you know, there's a roadmap of content, like that sort of stuff. Um, I think you know, the, the, the live service elements of some games, particularly, I'm thinking of Suicide Squad, Squad in particular, Suicide Squad, apologies, um, I think there's resistance among players um, to live. I think live service like kind of gets some heckles up for people. It's you know, it's it's like oh god, we're now going to be charged. Uh, we're going to be nickeled and dimed. We're going to yeah. be dragged out. Like you know, all the funds been drained out. I th I think that's the perception out there. I think it's also fatigue. I think yes. there's just an element of I, can you just give me a game I can finish. Yes, um, absolutely. And, so, yeah. and and I and I think there's a little bit of that. Um, obviously, that you were talking very specifically of the hardcore gaming audience that. Sort of I am, yeah. Shout, shout about these things, but there is certainly a, a, a an appetite, I think. But yeah, for things that are um, not, that, uh, you know, that, you know, aren't going. Oh, oh God! So released another DLC update, and it's just you just you just want to be able to play. You know, I think all of us do. I'm, I love live service games. I play it. I love, you know, I'm a massive Sea of Thieves fan. But, um, you know, I, I don't only want to play Sea of Thieves and I don't want the next game I play to be another Sea of Thieves. I want it to be probably a 10 hour story game that would do me just fine. Um, yeah. And I think that's all of us want. A, uh, all of us. For, hey, it's the games industry. I've been doing this for you know nearly 20 years. And ev every time there's a trend, sometimes it's a genre. Sometimes it's a, a, a business model. Sometimes it's a piece of hardware. Everyone rushes in. Oh yeah. my goodness. And of course, games take longer now. So it takes a little bit longer for the rushing to sort of really... Um, uh, be appreciated. Um, live service isn't new, but it's it, everyone seems to want to have a live service game now. I actually think we're at the cusp where people are going. Actually, maybe we stop. <laughs> so maybe, <laughs> I, I think we are getting because I think the thing is, thing is, as much premium games have got really expensive, you know, single player narrative games. If you can work out how to make those games efficiently and on a budget, they're sort of a relatively guaranteed. You can guarantee that you can makes you know you can not guarantee how much money you're going to make but you, you you feel a little bit more confident that you will make some money mm. you release a live service game you have no idea if you, it's just free to play you have no idea if you're going to make a single penny and you're banking on there being a, a an audience you've got an, you've got a developer there for a long for a longer period of time and look how many live service games have actually broken into them into that top 
layer of engaged games. Like it's still mm. the same, it's still GTA Online, it's still Fortnite, it's still Candy Crush, it's still Call of Duty, it's still the same games, it's still FIFA Ultimate Team. And it's it, every now and again one breaks in, it's very exciting. But when you think about how many are coming out, to have one every now and again break in, it, it's a bit. Even the ones that do break in and get really exciting for a little bit disappear. Among Us and those sort of games mm. disappear quite you know quite quickly. It's really hard to maintain it um, because you're competing with all these people who've got their um, you know their league tables and their and their fan audience and their friends and stuff in, in other live service titles. It's really difficult. And I think you're going to get developers recognise this and actually think it's it's less risky um, <laughs> to just go here's a twenty hour um, story game because they now with subscription and stuff there's way to there's ways yeah. to monetize that post launch as well once you've got out of that that brief that brief period. So I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing people. I think games will always get updated and tweaked and stuff over time. But I wouldn't be surprised mm-hmm. if you move, see a shift back from my, my thing though is the games industry shifts back and then nobody does it i never you remember the time everyone was making a call of duty clone and now nobody makes a clone. no one does no oh, there's only shooter out there is call of duty i'm like there's <laughs> more there is room for more than one you don't have yeah. to all stop um it's a uh, um i remember when people used to play make 3d platforms now nobody does yeah <laughs> and it was just like it's, it's a, there's a middle ground between um um there being too much and then being it's it's no, that kind no. of it's that all or nothing attitude you see from a lot of sending like a lot of the bigger companies are like we either need this to be right up there top tier earning you know millions or we scrap it and I think there really does need to be that middle ground of like experimenting with stuff providing you recoup your costs whether that is with a live service game or with a you know a shorter single player program providing you recoup your costs and ideally get some level of profit that should be enough to keep the business going no, I grant you I don't run a business. Um, I don't have shareholders to answer to it, but like, ideally that would be enough is... There is there is a growth element to it. The thing is what I say about live service, people criticise it, but I actually think it's it, it helps for a more sustainable industry, generally. Like mm. if you've got, if you've got, if you're, you, if you're a company with a decent live service title, it doesn't matter if a few of your games flop or they don't quite hit. Yeah. Because you've got that undercurrent of regular recurring revenue that's just keeping things. Oh, that didn't work, but that's fine. You know, we've got it's it's okay. We, we've got we had this guaranteed revenue. Whereas when you hit back to the hit based industry of like you're releasing five games and two of them have to hit, or you're going to have to start laying things off, we're in trouble, right? That is that was never that was always people talk about the industry being unstable now, and it is, but it's going for a moment rather than a, a, a something that was permanently an issue for like mm. several years you know you had to have people you know activision would release 10 games in a year and all it needed was two of them to do the numbers and it was it made up for the eight that failed and it's just that like, that was never a, a nice industry to sort of be part of i think i think that sustainability that that regular re- revenue is, is useful particularly for those really big companies that want to do stuff in triple a mm. um so, and i think live service enables that it just there's just isn't room there isn't room we don't have time for all no. of those games and um and i think i know i'm looking at what sony's doing and i'm and i saw naughty dog pulled away from it and i think that might be maybe there's an element of actually when we get close to release we have to ask ourselves are we really ready to commit to this mm. um because if we you know it's 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 tough and there's and we are competing with ourselves and that's that's the thing like you know live services are as much as much as like you know a lot of the it, it, a common criticism against live service games and i'm using that in the broad you know stereotypical sense that people look at them a lot of the criticism is that they are just out to kind of monetize you as much as possible and dominate you know like can kind of consume as much of your your income as possible but they're also out there as you say to consume much of your time like they're built to yeah require like daily logins and you know like constant and they're built on the assumption or perhaps the hope that you're not going to play anything else and that i mean i'm talking personally i can't be alone on this like that kind of puts me off like i i, tr- I finally tried pal world the other day and it was like okay interesting ideas reasonably good execution i see why people are really enjoying this I have absolutely no time for it. I, I, I do not have the time to pour into it. But it's clearly built with the assumption that you are going to play this and this alone. And games overall aren't like that. Like game, Games are a, a medium that people do... I mean, I grant you, like, yeah, millions of people do dedicate themselves to one title. But millions of other people do kind of play a variety. And well, live think, service think... doesn't allow for that. I think industry wide it's a challenge. I think if you're hmm. call it, if you're if the EA aren't bothered about it, but I think if you're not bothered <laughs> that the other publishers are struggling to find but it, 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 uh, audiences. But yeah, like is it, a, is it PlayStation revealed last year a million people on PS5 or just PlayStation platforms generally only play Call of Duty. Yeah, 
that's mad. Like they're that's not insane. PlayStation. They're not PlayStation players. They're Call of Duty players. Yeah. That's their, and um, and that is a um, that is a uh, that is that is an industry we live in. People play. I've got I've got a bunch of friends that only play FIFA or EA Sports FC. And that's, but and that's that's a sh- they used to play more. They mm. don't need to now. They've they've been engaged by their game, and I think it has long term a potential long term implications. But I do think we might see a bit of a push away from it. Well, I await the push with uh, anticipation. Um, that is all we've got time for today. Chris, thank you so much for joining me, as always. Thank you. Oh, always a delight, isn't it, James? It's always. good. It's good. It's, it's, it's my Monday morning highlight. Um, we are going to be back next Monday with another microcast. You can find all previous episodes of the microcast uh, on the podcasting platform of your choice, as well as our full-blown podcast, which will return at some point. The last few microcasts are on our YouTube channel, and you can get more news, insight, and insight... Oh. I said insight twice. You get double the insight. News, insight, and analysis into the world behind video games at gamesindustry.biz.